Thank you very much. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to be speaking here this evening. First, let me express my gratitude to the Bengal Foundation for enabling me to be here this week. And especially, I need to acknowledge the very generous invitation from the director of the Bengal Architecture and Design Institute, Professor Kazi Khalid Ashraf, to spend time with his excellent students at the Bengal Foundation, where this week we have been examining the concept of tropicality, modernism, and the tropics more generally. I've been made so very welcome by the Institute staff, and so in Bangla, I hope I get this right, Danyabad. Thank you. This is my third trip to Dhaka. It's been great to re-meet friends like Rafi Kazam, to renew acquaintances and to make new friends. The experience has been enriching, not just for the students, but also for me, as I learn more about your fascinating and your very exciting city. The storm today, the sudden plunge into darkness before the rain was something that I'd never before experienced. So let me get on with my, my lecture. The title of the lecture is Poetry in Section, The Architecture of Glen Merkett. And what I'm going to do is take you through, if you like, a biographical picture of Glen Merkett to see how he develops a personal poetry, a poetry, a poetry which I believe he expresses through the architectural drawing of the section, his favourite technique of creating architecture through the architectural section. And in many respects, one of the forgotten lessons, if you like, across architectural education today, the section should be one of the most celebrated of, of drawings. So here's Glenn Merkett, born in 1936. He's born actually in London. His parents were making a trip from where they were living at the time, which was in New Guinea. So there's a tropical beginning to Merkett's career. His parents are briefly in London. They're actually going to visit the 1936 Olympic Games in, in Berlin. And then they come back to uh, New Guinea, where they will live from 1936 until 1942. And so I'm going to be talking about Merkut's life and his architecture. And, but first, we need to see where does Merkut actually practice today? So this is Sydney. This is where Glenn Merkett practices from. And where does he actually work in this city of four and a half million people? So, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. So he, this is Sydney, of course, Sydney Opera House by Jorn Utzon. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is across to the left. But Glenn Merkett lives and works right over here right near the heads to the Sydney Harbour. So Glen Merkert lives in a, the most populated city in Australia, but this is the view from the street in which his office and house is. So it's a street that has a view of landscape, of which, if you screen the bottom of the image, there are no buildings. It's as if this was a country that had only just been discovered but it's always been one that has been settled for more than 40,000 years by the local Aboriginal people. So Merkut at once is part of the metropolis, but at the same time he's actually living in a landscape with a distant horizon, much the same landscape that would have been seen by the first set white settlers in Australia. And that connection to the land is going to be one of extraordinary importance to him. And probably largely driven by his upbringing, which was in Papua New Guinea. So as a young boy from 1936 until 1942, when World War II broke out and the family had to return to uh, Sydney, the Merkits lived in the jungle. His father was a gold prospector and a, a very determined man who ha had a great influence on the young Glenn Merkert. But Merkert would have been familiar with these, l what we call, New Guinea longhouses. Long, single-cell houses, collective dwellings l largely, which in historic uh, illustrations were elevated often high on poles, high-set houses, and they were basically linear rectangular forms. The gable meant that 
any fires that were lit up on the floor inside, the smoke could actually uh, emerge out through the gable ends. So these were also ventilating from underneath as well. It was a very practical and sensible type for the tropics. When Merkut was being brought up here and then back in Sydney, his father would press upon him various books and also architectural journals, even before he'd gone to uh, uh, the university to study architecture. And one of the most important texts which Merkut was given by his father was this one, Walden, Life in the Woods, by the American uh, philosopher, poet and activist, uh, Henry David Thoreau. And in this text, which Merkut was encouraged to read by his father, uh, Thoreau talks about the need, the necessary need, to make connection with landscape. That is, through our busy lives, there are moments when you actually need to get back to the essentials in life and to get back to the essentials of nature. And it's an idea that Merkut was to not really quite understand as a young schoolboy, but it, the lessons of this American philosopher... This book is written in 1854, so you can imagine as a young high school boy, um, uh, it wasn't necessarily first on his list to read. But Merkut was also pressed by his father to look at architecture, again, even before he'd start, gone to, to, to study. So in the Merkut household, they would be treated to regular editions of the Architectural Forum, which in those early 1950s would see architecture like the Eames House, the work of Gordon Drake in California, and of course, Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House. So again, there's this inculcation of modern architecture as he is at school, and also his father is an amateur architect. And this is one of several Merkett houses which the young Glenn Merkett lived in uh, uh, during his childhood. So this is a house designed by his, sorry, by his father, uh, to his father's own design, but clearly understanding the uh, uh, recent work of Harry Seidler. So Arthur Merkett was designing his own versions of a Harry Seidler house. So Merkett is actually living in, if you like, a sort of architectural environment. Now, when Merkut actually then moves to study at New South Wales Institute of Technology, it later became the University of New South Wales, the sort of buildings that are being built in Sydney at the time are lightweight, lean, architectural, if you like, tents in the trees. So Merkut would have admired, as did many of his colleagues, this house by the architects Bill and Ruth Lucas, which is in Castle Crag, one of the bush suburbs of Sydney. And Merkut also, as a student, worked for Neville Grusman. And Neville Grusman uh, specialised in houses that perched lightly on the Sydney rock landscape, which used minimal uh, 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 materials and Grusman would, use, would, use, would always try and make his roofs as thin as possible and his engineering as thin as possible. And so even before Merkut had graduated, he'd designed his first house. And this is it, the John Devitt house. John Devitt was a champion uh, swimmer, as was Merkut. Uh, but uh, uh, Merkut designs this very interesting and little-known house uh, before he graduates. And it has some key lessons which are already implicit in Merkut's philosophy to designing architecture. From the street, it's relatively blank. Because in Sydney, the idea is the prospect beyond, the view beyond. So the design of this house is all about actually placing a wall to create, if you like, a barrier of privacy to the street, but also to the breeze um, the cold breezes that can, can come from the south in Sydney to face to the north to look out onto the prospect of the harbour. So this notion of actually placing one's back and actually embracing one's arms against the cold winds that come from us in Australia to face the sun and face the view is a very typical, almost phenomenological response to living in the great continent that's Australia. When uh, uh, Merkut uh, uh, graduated, 
from the University of New South Wales, as it, as it had beca become. He, as did many Australian architects, young architects, took an overseas grand tour, in particular made the trip back to Europe. And on his trip, he went to a whole range of countries, but chief amongst them was Scandinavia. At that time in Sydney, architecture culture was heavily influenced, oddly enough, by another architecture culture at the periphery, that of Scandinavia. So Merkut went to see the um, buildings of Alvar Aalto, San Atzalo Town Hall here, the buildings of Jorn Utzen, the Kingo Terrace Houses of 1956, and this building in particular, the chapel by Heike Siren. And it's important, all of these three buildings are important because they involve landscape. The courtyard house, which has its protected courtyard of exotic plants, but looking out into a wilderness field. The town hall, which has an artificial grassed acropolis where you go up to, if you like, a collection of buildings around an elevated green. And this one in particular, from the, the uh, 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 parishioners, look out beyond the priest to where the cross is, and the cross is in the natural landscape. So you're looking out into the landscape, which is, if you like, God's creation. Merkut also on this trip went to Greece and was particularly influenced by the island of Mykonos. And this is one of Merkut's drawings where he draws the space around the objects. So these are churches, like these ones here. Merkut is actually studying the space between objects. It's a lesson which all of us as architects need to understand, that the spaces between objects are just as important as the objects themselves. And it's this drawing technique of actually looking at what are the boundaries of one's experiential uh, condition of experiencing objects that is very important here. On his return to Australia, he buys a Californian bungalow and builds onto it at the rear, but he builds a Messian addition at the back. It's in the style of Mies van der Rohe, glass, abstracted form. The furniture that he buys is all the international, if you like, uh, 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 approved chairs by Marcel Breuer and the like. There's even a Lucabusia chaise longue. But the language is an assured internationalism. And for a young architect, this is almost like a tribute to the architects he'd idolised since school days. And even in his next houses, he designs versions of the Mesian Pavilion House for Daphne Merkett. These are all houses for family members. The pavilion, but remember this, the pavilion with two open ends, kitchen, dining room, living room and bedroom. Simple. Even at this very young age, he's almost perfecting the pavilion and the Mesian Courtyard House, where the space of the house can actually embrace this outdoor space, the bedrooms do as well, and it's actually an orchestration of arrival. And his drawings give you an indication of uh, an empathy with the landscape setting, the ideas of arrival, reception, concealing uh, 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 courtyard spaces behind. And in this early career, it reaches a climax with this building here. This is the Laurie Short House, the first Laurie Short House at Terry Hills. It's a bush suburb in Sydney. And we can see his tribute to Mies van der Rohe continues. Black steel frame, flat roof. But what's interesting is that Merkut starts to actually perforate the roof and actually cut back into the parasol. But notice the drawing style again. It's like he, he was did in Mykonos. He shows you the outdoor space before you reach the wilderness beyond. And the parasol is actually almost nudges right up against it. And it's as if he's actually feathering the courtyard wall in, to become landscape. This house gains him accolades from the profession. It's uh, 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 assured. It actually owes a debt to his idol at the time, the Los Angeles architect Craig Elwood. And there's a sense of reaching the horizon 
and Merkut is starting to develop an idea which he will be able to articulate much more clearly in the next decade of prospect and refuge, that any dwelling should have the ability to actually retreat into, like you can retreat into a cave, and from there have a prospect to a distant horizon. The sort of ideas that uh, Henry Thoreau would have spoken about, but also that by the late 1960s, the theoretician J. Appleton, Appleton is to actually write about which Merkut will enjoy. And the house is actually starting to develop Merkut's appreciation of actually bringing that prospect within the, um, uh, the purview of the parasol proper. But Merkut makes a second trip overseas, and this is the really important one. And this is where the story starts to get more complex and we see that there is, if you like, uh, uh, Merkut starting to lose the burden of uh, being a, dis a disciple. On this next trip, it's 1973. He goes to Mexico, Los Angeles, where he meets his idol, Craig Elwood. He goes to Chicago. He sees, he goes and visits Illinois Institute of Technology in the Mies van der Rohe campus. He's upset because it's in a state of great decay. He goes and meets Craig Elwood, sees the case study houses. He also goes to Spain and meets another idol, Josep Kadersh, great Spanish modernist. At exactly the same time that he's away, he comes back in early 1974. In October 1973 is the oil crisis. That's one of the most important dates in, if you like, energy history. All of a sudden, the United States understands what it is to not have gas and to not have energy at their fingertips just by bringing out their wallets. And it's very interesting because this is a profound time internationally to do with energy and it has an effect on Merkut's sensibility, in particular as he thinks back on what he saw and what he experienced on this trip. The other, other important building that he sees is this one. It's the second time he's visited, and he, on the second trip, he gets in. It's Maison de Verre, Pierre Chéreau and Bernard Bigervais' masterpiece uh, uh, in Paris. You go through a courtyard door into a, 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 a courtyard, and then it, behind this glass block screen. It's impeccably detailed with the precision almost like of a racing car. And Merkut likes this very much. He also likes Jose Luis Cadersh's houses of courtyards and louvered screens. He also likes Craig Elwood's reinterpretation of Mr. van der Rohe. But he's terribly upset when he asks Craig Elwood, how do you cope with the weather here in Los Angeles. What do you do? I can't see any form of climate modulation here. And Craig Elwood laughed and said to Merkut, I just turn the air conditioning on. Now, Merkut, to his credit, in 1973, uh, was upset by this. Because in Australia, there wasn't always, with a residential climate client, the money to do that sort of thing. In Australia, we'd had to make do, we'd had to invent ways of actually making our buildings comfortable. And so, while he admired the aesthetic precision of Craig Elwood, he was a little deterred by the ease with which climate was brushed off. On that same trip, Merkut made it to Walden Pond, where Henry Thoreau had written his famous book. And this experience of actually going to the place seeing the, the place which, uh, in the, with, about the book that his father had pressed into his hands made him realise some very important things. And that was to actually start to think very closely about environment, landscape and an ethical responsibility as an architect. On his return to Australia, he found that he started to take a strong interest in, in simple buildings, buildings like shearing sheds, buildings like rail sheds that used humble materials that had a sort of noble dignity in their simplicity. And there was also a new appreciation for the indigenous shelter of Australia in Australian outback. And he made studies of bark, 
huts, bark shelters. He also looked at the way the bark actually peels off the tree, a, a eucalypt. Every year this happens with these trees and you'll find your garden is full of this bark if you have this particular sort of eucalypt. It peels itself away. And he also came to understand how indigenous shelter actually operated in Australia, where you see here, this is a Pichinjara camp. These are uh, in Aboriginal people. These are little family tent uh, uh, shelters. But you can see they're all facing the one way because this is they're putting their backs of these shelters to the prevailing wind. So everyone is facing down the page, so to speak, and Merkett starts to understand this has a lot of similarities to the way that he's been thinking about his courtyard houses, how one might actually exist in this landscape. And he also starts to understand contemporary Australian painters like Fred Williams, who was starting to actually depict the Australian landscape, not as ugly as many white settlers had originally thought, but as having a very strange beauty. And he gets another commission for from Laurie Short, that same client that he'd done the Mesian black parasol, he gets to do a house at Crescent Head in the country, up near Kempsey. And it's a very different sort of house than he designed before. Two rectangles with open ends. It's almost like the Daphne Merkett house, cut in half, and then laid side by side. But he doesn't join them. In the tradition of the Australian homestead, which is often built over time, he separates them. So this becomes a breezeway between. Also, it means that you can have cross ventilation diagonally across the two, two uh, uh, volumes as well. And if we compare this to Miss van der Rohe's Farnsworth house, where this is a terrace platform, we see some similarity, but we start to see profound differences. It's almost as if Merkett is starting to make a critique of his master and actually learn and go further. And also, he puts a roof on it. He puts two roofs, and so he starts to think carefully about the section. And you notice it'll become clearer in the next image, but he starts to actually layer the roof understand the roof as, as you might. What you might do with the bark of a tree, something that can actually exist in layers. And the building has a quality of the vernacular of those rural farm sheds, but it's an utterly sophisticated shed. It's an elegant shed. And in the landscape, these become almost heroic classically cited objects with fly screens and louvers and the reason to do the second tier is to actually provide a ventilating space much like the indigenous people would have, be, would have put bark up to form a roof and then to keep the weather out they would have folded another piece of bark over the top like a piece, like a piece of flashing and here it provides the roof venting uh, uh, and, and you can do this with corrugated iron. And he starts a habit of wherever he goes, drawing, and drawing using often the architectural section. So these notebooks, many of which are now lodged in the State Library of New South Wales, become the way in which you can actually design using your hand on the paper and build with your hand as you build the section through the drawing. Merkut eventually then buys this property uh, off the original owners and extends it as well. So this is it in its extended form. And inside, there's also a certain simplicity. There's an austerity. This is not the Mesian interior that we saw earlier, but it's warm, textured, and it's a place where there's invention in detail and in folding doors, sliding doors, where you can actually move the, the uh, louvers up and down to adjust the... Uh, sun uh, conditions in the house. He still does so, uh, courtyard houses. And uh, this one is the Ockens house where he is actually framing the view. It's a, a, the Mesian uh, courtyard house, but now he actually uh, uh, creates it around the courtyard. So this, beca this becomes, you enter from below.
uses the, the slope of the land and actually creates a platform within it. You're floating above the, the land and actually he then perforates the roof above. Like the New Guinea longhouses, these are single cell in width and he starts to develop a habit of actually placing the services in, in groups and in bands. And so this is the kitchen um, uh, and bathroom area uh, of the house and you actually delineate a roof over the top. So you start to actually st become more expressive. So what Mercat is doing in these houses is developing a typology. It worked well with the uh, uh, Mari Short House. Now it's starting to be developed with each successive house, almost in the way that Aldo Rossi would develop a typology. Uh, Mercat is starting to develop a language for himself and a language for Australian residential architecture. Bear in mind too, though, that these are houses for uh, 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 fairly comfortable people. Um, in a way, what Mercat is doing here is doing the same what Andrea Palladio was doing, was developing almost like a villa typology for the Australian uh, semi-rural rural outback. And always, the drawing that is key is section where you can learn how to ventilate, light, shade and build the house, all of those things which he was critical of, of Craig Elwood in Los Angeles. At the same time, he gains a few uh, 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 commercial commissions. And this one is the restaurant at Barara Waters. And this is where Mercat is actually exploring this idea of entering a house from below and you come to this restaurant by water, by boat, come off the boat and then up into this space. So you return up, turn back on yourself into the space here. So you're coming off the boat, face up the slope, so you get a view up the slope and then turn around and the prospect is an incredible surprise of this stretch of pit water uh, beyond. Mercat then also gains another non-residential commission out in rural uh, New South Wales, north of Sydney, at Kempsey. And he designs a local history museum and information centre. Now he actually uses the linear form, almost this railway carriage-like form, to create a group of buildings. And he has the same lessons of actually not butting the building, the, those linear forms together, but creating interstitial spaces between these uh, uh, linear forms. So what's interesting is that the dwelling form of single cell width can actually then, placed together, become an institutional building. One can see in this echoes of Louis Kahn's Kimball Museum, of course, but in Merkitt's hand it becomes uh, very personal. You can see that there's a uh, an attention to actually making these museum spaces entirely uh, uh, um, uh, self-ventilating with the ventilators on the top uh, and there are ventilators underneath these glazing areas at the side. And the reason that Mercat is actually doing this is to actually delineate a series of very thin steel columns and so at these edges become ventilating areas. And this is all determined, again, by the section. So this section, you can actually see all of that work that's being done to ventilate these spaces is also happening at the edges. It's also important as to where you collect water. And collecting water for Mercat becomes almost an heroic preoccupation. His gutters and downpipes become minor monuments in almost all of his uh, architecture. And inside, it's delicate, lightweight, detailed with the precision of Maison Chereau. At the same time, he gets more of these houses, these linear houses. The Frederick's farmhouse, he actually does the two linear blocks and actually moves one uh, further along than the other so that it depending, because we're now on a sloping site, and he makes the roof steeper in this case so that you can actually have a little loft bedroom above. And you have the doubled uh, uh, fold, almost as if we're folding it out of stringy bark. And the section again is where, the, where you can actually see that, that uh, sleeping loft 
all ventilated and making use of an existing chimney. And you can see here too, he's using, making use of the landscape very carefully to make the building float uh, at, at its edge. And there's a rigour to this work, a simplicity and in harking back to that noble dignity of the vernacular. He perhaps reaches the apotheosis of this linear house with the Ball Easterway house, approached diagonally as one might approach a temple, a Greek temple. The correct way to approach a temple is a Greek temple is asymmetrically, not on axis. And here, this orchestration of arrival means that you come through the bush, through the door, and you're met with a blank wall. And there's a painting, a series of paintings here, because this is for an artist, Sidney Ball, this, this house. And then you turn to your right, and there's the view out into the pro distant landscape. And the building actually feathers off into the, into the edge, into that landscape. Or if you want a moment of solitude, you open those, either one of those doors, and it's almost as if you're in a, on the moon viewing platform at the Katsura Palace looking into another distant prospect or the bedrooms behind another prospect again. And this is the house as completed. This is looking from the back, from the bedroom side. Here are these monumental downpipes. And the building is actually made light at its edges. So you want the thinnest of edges, like the thinnest of, of edges that you get on a eucalypt leaf. And the inspiration is also coming by designing the section using the possibility of corrugated iron, which is, has the same characteristics of stringy bark, where you can actually, with a single sheet, form it into a beautiful uh, barrel vaulted curve. And then sit on the edge of that house and float gently above the landscape, not touching it or touching it minimally, like the indigenous people also touch the ground minimally. And inside, you can define the interior like a cave or the cleft of a rock where you can actually have no windows at all but just sit out there and enjoy the view. Another landmark house for him is the uh, Magni House at Binji Point at Maruya. And again, the, the project starts with drawings and the drawing of the section. Because once you've got the section right, you can extrude these houses because that's the, the, the best way to actually exist in Australia is to face the sun, put your back to the wind. And this is Bingy Point here. And what's interesting is the house is actually, the, in terms of its linear delineation, is actually facing down the coast. Many people in Australia think you should face directly out into the ocean. Well, it's going to be a very dull view. You'll just get a horizon and blue. But if you face along the coast, you'll get a completely different view and you'll get a view of landscape. And the plan is utterly rational. You put your back to the, to the southerly winds, the cold southerly winds. You group all the services along the back, bathrooms, kit, kitchen, laundry, and then you live in all of these spaces and you notch that plan. So this is an indoor-outdoor space, almost as if the whole house is a windbreak just for this outdoor dining room. And that's the view that you're going to get from here. You actually um, have this distant prospect, which you would not have got if you'd faced the house directly out to the ocean. This way you get the landscape. And Merkut works hard. Uh, 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 ventilate the back of the, the uh, uh, house, which is where the little curve jumps up, like the curve of a wave. And then the house opens up as if you're in, in, in this architectural cave to the greater landscape. Always uh, thinking about prospect and refuge, being able to retreat to the smaller scale on the far right and then open up. And the house then becomes a description of this section, beautifully detailed, and a place that you can actually close down or open up and you can sit in that cleft, protected from the wind, 
shaded and enjoy the prospect. Now these have been houses, of course, which are, in extra which are often in extraordinary landscapes, but he's also skilled at building in the city. This is the uh, Stuart Littlemore house where he puts a back to a party wall and that's on the bottom of the page, groups all the services again, including the stairs, and then will, has notched the plan in here for an outdoor, this is all outdoors here, and so that you actually, um, I've lost this, oh, there it is, uh, uh, bedrooms upstairs, and the reason to do this is because you're facing a little public park, which you don't own, but the spaces actually can face in. You use the uh, glass blocks that, w that uh, he so loved from Maison de Verre, and the section is all about making that possible. So it's almost as if you're in a little tree house in, up, in that upper level of the house, and the section is a description of that linear plan. So those grouped services and a very generous, gracious corridor are defined by that little gable-roofed edge on the right, and the living spaces, almost this habitable veranda, becomes this grand uh, uh, facade facing the park. Merkut also does, uh, um, in the 1980s, a whole series of unbuilt projects which are beautifully sited. This one was unbuilt. It was a, a, an Aboriginal alcoholic rehabilitation centre uh, 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 at uh, northern New South Wales and uh, sadly unbuilt, but we'll see echoes of it in uh, ensuing projects. With each project, Merkut is exploring new ideas and particularly with non-residential buildings. And these hand sketches for the uh, Minerals and Mining Museum resolve in themselves into a most exquisite plan. This is a, uh, another single room width building. It's a mining museum in a remote part of New South Wales where they first mined iron ore for making steel. Broken Hill, you might know BHP, Broken Hill. Uh, uh, the entrance is from uh, the top of the page and the line that you see which has a slight zigzag is a whole series of uh, wind catches or as the Persians would say, malcavs. And th these are, and there's a water body here as well and the whole building is designed around catching the wind. So here, Merkut is inspired by uh, 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 ancient and well-tried climatic uh, uh, mediators. So here are these malcaps on that zigzag wall with the water body. And this is a giant wind catcher as well to actually uh, 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 effectively passively cool the entire building. A great project which sadly was never built. This is uh, a, a 3D reconstruction which we did in 2014 for the Venice Biennale uh, where I was one of the curators of the exhibit. Merkut also designs in the inner city and it's the section of the Magni house where he alters this existing 19th century house to make it into one of his classic versions of refuge and prospect out to the rear of this, the property. And the detailing inside is exquisite, almost as if we were in the Maison de Verre. And he also designs, this is his house, which is almost a tribute to uh, uh, Jose Louis Kudersh. This is the uh, Kendone house in Mossman, where he uses the idea of, of contained courtyard spaces to define a very sophisticated uh, urban in an urban house, and in many respects, a lesser known work by Merkut. This idea of drawing occurs in every project. And this is the, the uh, Mega house at Barrel, where the roof form is key. The roof form is about getting the sun, but also making a gesture to the landscape, and actually, uh, uh, if you like, talking with the landscape. So the sectional drawing, and it might be a sectional sketch turned into a drawing, becomes part of the overall schema for how one might eventually organise the structure and then extrusion along the contour. Uh, 
Merkert also, in this period, in the uh, late 80s, is designing for some very wealthy clients. He designs an entirely new house next to their other house, <laughs> which is the one on the left. Uh, and th the, um, uh, this family, who are very wealthy, they make a lot of money out of cardboard, um, uh, they live in the Merkert house, which is the one on the right, which is almost like living in a Rolex watch, um, and they entertain uh, publicly because they're great philanthropists, they give enormous amounts of money to uh, the arts, they entertain in the building on the left. And Merkert has designed, it's not very well publicised this house because of the nature of the, uh, the clients. But he, even for these very wealthy clients, he actually keeps to his same philosophy uh, of uh, the single room width uh, uh, linear block. It's just two storeys higher uh, this time, but it's the same language. And the language continues through the 1990s with the Simpson Lee house. The roof form is changed subtly each time, but it's the same lessons every time, and the same attention to section. Merkert works on his own. He generally doesn't work with assistants. It's him, with his very familiar writing, inscribing, almost uh, uh, overreaching, one might say, uh, on these sectional drawings. So he knows when he's drawing, he's almost as if he's building it in, in, in his mind. And this is how, how the, how, why, why I think there's so much success in these uh, uh, particular uh, projects. Another important uh, house for Merkert, and one that we, he really holds very dear, is one for an Indigenous client. And this is for a, an Aboriginal woman and her uh, white husband, at Yukala in the Northern Territory. A very re remote site on a beach, where everything has to uh, be trucked in. There's no building materials really on site. Uh, it's a place which is rich in painting traditions of uh, the Yukala people. And Merkut looks at the colours and materiality of these bark paintings, these uh, so-called X-ray paintings of the region. He starts to do a whole series of drawings. And invariably, the section is part of that. How can you actually efficiently and rigorously build in this place and respond to indigenous uh, culture? And he makes analogies with the uh, structure of an onion, of peeling away layers and thinking very hard about how one might actually not touch the earth and make this house, which is in the, the subtropics, of Australia respond very easily to climate. He also has a good knowledge of 19th, 19th century colonial architecture in the Northern Territory, where government houses were built entirely of slats. So these are white, white uh, public servants uh, having whole houses built of slats. And Merkut understands this he actually knows the measurements between each of these battens and then will reproduce it up here at the Marika Alderton House. So he's looking at the structures of indigenous, local indigenous shelter, top right. He wants to use the battens that he knows that 19th century settlers um, uh, had used and he wants to actually still keep some of, many of the ideas that he used in his early houses. And the house that results is quite a revelation because Merkut starts to actually project now out from the linear box. So these are little sleeping platforms. He holds the, the uh, bays above the floor to ventilate. You can, these, there are flaps that can open up. The, it's all prefabricated, so it can be built simply and easily. And the spaces that result are effortlessly relaxed thinning out the edge of the, of the house wherever possible, making it breathe like traditional indigenous shelter, using the colours and textures of the paintings that the Yukala people would actually also use. And also, back home, experimenting on his own property with building a little guest house, 
always using every project as another step to move his typology along. And then in the Northern Territory, again in a tropical setting, collaborating with a firm of architects called Tropo Architects, uh, who invited Merkut to collaborate with them in the Bawali Visitors Information Centre in the Kakadu National Park. Tropo and uh, Merkut worked very well together. They started to think about this linear typology that Glenn uh, often uses, but also the need to introduce more shading than normal in this extreme uh, climate, also to introduce a water body in the middle of the building to actually allow gaps between the building. This is a public building, so to allow generous spaces that are constantly in shade, but also going to protect you from the extraordinary rain that happens at the monsoon period of, uh, of, of each year. And the section, again, is key of how to resolve it and how to actually build it. And in this case, using rammed earth and using his similar, uh, 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 if you like, palette of elements for the Australian landscape. The linear houses continue, and this is a very beautiful one at Kangaroo Valley. And in plan, you start to see the same things happening. He's prepared to actually do a projection out but also to be prepared to actually open the landscape right out through, this is the kitchen, that's that little, uh, that little projection here, and then beyond that on the other side you can slide the doors right back to open up to this prospect. And again you see very clearly that almost uh, uh, gesture to indigenous shelter of embracing, uh, uh, putting one's back to the south winds, opening up to the landscape. And that's the, the view here in that major living room. One of the crowning moments of his career before he got the Pritzker Prize in 2002 was the Arthur and Yvonne Boyd uh, Education Centre. This is a place where uh, the painter, Arthur Boyd, and his wife, Yvonne, bequeathed a substantial amount of money to bring young painters, young artists, and also young architects through the Glen Merkett Masterclass uh, to this extraordinary site on the Shoalhaven River south of New South Wales. Um, this was a place which the painter Arthur Boyd used to paint regularly and constantly. And Boyd would paint the river and the surrounding landscape at any time of the day. And what amazed him as a painter was how this landscape could change colour, mood, and it was the same landscape every time. But it was just the time of the day or the season. It would actually change completely its character. On the one hand to become, if you like, docile and another to become an angry landscape and in another case to become absolutely serene. So Merkut, I think, found this very challenging. Uh, he had to deal with not a uh, interfering with the existing homesteads, the old 19th century homestead, which Boyd had painted, used to use as his painting studio, one of these buildings, and then introduce a new facility, if you like a multi-residential facility and a big dining hall activity hall at one end. So he doesn't uh, come close to them. He builds a separate building, a separate, if you like, complex, like you might as an Australian homestead, build a big shearing shed. And it's sited so delicately that this is the prominent building, this is the dining room, and then the residential area, the bedroom uh, wing, actually, if you like, folds away, almost as if I'm putting my hand slightly uh, behind me. We get a bit closer and we see that there is this big cleft in which you can actually eat or teach outdoors and these doors can open up to the landscape and you can see coming from uh, uh, the landscape beyond, you're not even aware of that large dormitory block behind. And Merkut sketches, again using sectional details, tries to understand how to resolve this, with the aim always being that when you're in a space like this, which is the dining room, the river is what is takes priority. It's not so much about whether this is a grand space, but it's what you see from it. And also, a space that you can set up for a formal dinner, 
but more importantly for Mercat, a space in which you can actually teach and talk about architecture or talk about painting. And then when you've finished work, you go behind this corridor, behind the building, so you actually then don't have that river view, come to your little bedroom and you share. You share these rooms. It's not like a hotel. Um, it's actually quite, not primitive, but it's like a little uh, experience as if you're going on a, on a boat. When you go into the, the room, you're sharing, uh, you can actually divide the room, but you're sharing with three others. And it's like climbing into a little boat. And you open flaps in these bays that you see on the bottom, which actually project off a concrete substructure. So this is a departure for Mercat, um, and the language is exciting. All of a sudden, we're now getting these little, if you like, plywood nests, which are actually perched off a rock face, almost as if this, these are uh, uh, outcrops of a special fungus or even a, a, um, uh, another rock embedded in a, a much larger rock. It's all to do with shading. It's all to do with being able to open and close the flaps to create darkness so you can sleep. And behind, you realise that what he's created is actually a, a quite monumental and extraordinary piece of architecture. Now, I'm realising I I'm, I'm, uh, need to move ahead. So Merkut's career at this time, he takes, because it's him, he collaborated here with Wendy Lewin, his um, second wife, and an Indigenous architect, Reg Lark, but he continued, these larger projects took a lot of time. He, at the same time, he was still doing smaller houses, where the section also was now being explored even further. But I'm going to actually uh, finish with two, I think, really very interesting projects. One unbuilt, uh, one nearly finished. The first one is the Australian Opal Centre at Lightning Ridge in New South Wales. Um, it's still in design phases, but what's interesting here is that Mercat is actually thinking about uh, uh, environment again. The section is going to be key in terms of how one draws, draws it here, and it's a centre to actually display opals, which you get, of course, those beautiful jewel-like rocks from underground. And being underground in Australia is cool, literally. It's quite cool. So he's going to submerge the building below ground and to actually keep any of the spaces below ground, uh, above ground cool as well, he's going to use a whole series of malcafs. So he's going to use this ancient Persian technique. The building is going to be partially underground. And at the top, because we're in Lightning Ridge, it's the hottest place in Australia. He's actually going to cover the whole roof with solar panels as well, as well as another roof. And here are these Malkaf uh, 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 forms trying to actually um, uh, uh, draw the cool air from underground through the building so that it becomes passively uh, uh, cooled. And the building actually look, will look, one hopes it will get built, with this roofscape of solar collectors, the malcaps, the wind catches on either side, and in some respects, and you can hear, here you see these in section as well, in some respects this is Merkut's uh, tribute to another of his great uh, idols is the Egyptian architect Hassan Fathi. Uh, and Merkut's quite open uh, uh, about this. But it's, uh, I think, uh, again, one of these buildings where he's uh, uh, almost uh, typified by his linear houses, but in his public buildings, they become quite extraordinary. The last project I want to show is a mosque. This is the Newport Mosque. Newport is an industrial suburb in Melbourne. Uh, uh, and he's designing this with the uh, uh, local architect, Hakan Alevli. And uh, the site is in not a very attractive area. It's got a golf course here, not one of Melbourne's best. Uh, and it's got a high school to the north here. Uh, there's a, a model railway um, place where you can go and um, 
uh, sit on a sort of miniature railway. It's very odd. Um, and this was a, an empty, what was proposed to be industrial site. Merkut and Hakan uh, worked very closely with the council, uh, firstly to allow a mosque to be built in this suburb uh, because uh, uh, any new and large uh, uh, religious building has to go through a very uh, long and extensive planning process. The, it should be said the, the Newport Islamic community is very strong, very vocal, and uh, they also were very keen to commission uh, Merkut. They understood his value as trying to define an Australian uh, architecture, contemporary architecture, and they wanted to, to define a contemporary language for Australian Islam in, in architectural terms. And uh, they don't have a lot of money. It's taken a long time to actually uh, uh, the project to, 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 get, to get it happening. And Glenn came down to Melbourne. He did a workshop with some of our students uh, as a way of actually him understanding the project. Uh, so we were very grateful that uh, um, he and I and a group of students could actually workshop ideas. He'd never designed a mosque before, so this was new, and he was learning as well. And the community were very generous in teaching him about uh, all the various aspects of what a mosque entailed, that it's not just the space with the mihrab, which faces Mecca, and the need to actually have a separate women's entrance, which is here, and a space on Friday where you might have, in Melbourne, you might have nearly a 1,000 people here um, uh, on a Friday uh, at midday. Uh, and the project also on the top uh, uh, right of the plan will have the imam's house. It'll also have an education centre and it'll also be a place where uh, um, they can have community meetings. So it's, it's a giant complex. And it's probably very difficult to see. I won't because of the um, scale of the plans, but it's now under construction. Uh, and Merkut here is actually uh, using the section uh, and the idea of the wind catchers, the malcaps, which are also involved with colour and a geometric roof structure. So he's combining the malcaf to become, if you like, a repetitive roof structural system and skylight system for what essentially is a big box-like space. Uh, what you see here is the section which shows the minaret in the distance, and I'll talk a bit more about that in, the, in a moment. The air, ground floor um, area, the upper floor area for the women, which of course is screened. There's the imam's house and uh, the uh, part of the education centre. And this is the uh, uh, tactic that he's using for the roofscape. So this is all being framed up in steel. These are wind catchers and they are also bright in, um, ex panelled in extraordinary colours. Blues, greens, uh, golds and ultramarines. So it's a fab fabulous uh, geometric play above you. Uh, the 3D rendering gives you some indication. And, the side th and inside, uh, we're near the mirab, uh, uh, is in there's a wall, but b before the wall is a huge pool of water with light coming from above. So you'll actually be looking to uh, uh, the wall, uh, the mirror uh, is there, and then the water before you, and then the uh, 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 people praying uh, beyond. And the, this, this is um, Hakan's... I don't like this drawing much. <laughs> um, this is Hakan's 3D rendering, uh, and it's not a drawing which Glenn likes particularly either, so um, I'm glad that he's not here. He might be more, less polite than me. Um, but this is the space where uh, those, those extra numbers on a Friday prayers will actually uh, be able to pray. This is the separate women's entrance that they've got their separate prayer area hall upstairs. And this form here is the form of the wall, which is the uh, southern wall. So if I go back to help you understand this, that tall area is actually here. So the minaret is the raised part of the wall at this point here. And the water is here, the mirror is here, and the car parking is... Oh, can I have that? 
Uh, is it on now? And the car parking is uh, at the rear. So the, the whole idea is that when you arrive, the cars are actually concealed and that he wants to encourage uh, the parishioners to walk to this building to actually uh, um, um, uh, uh, be rid of all the cars and so that you actually uh, potentially make use of this great landscape that sits in front of the uh, uh, mosque. And this, I think, is perhaps most evocative of what he's trying to achieve. That fin wall is actually the minaret. He's trying to save money here for this community. They've had fundraisers for, ne for nearly nine years to try and raise money for this building. Uh, and there you can see also, too, the multicoloured uh, skylights, malcaps, um, that they're actually part of the, the project. Now, I've spoken probably too long, and I'm going to, to finish, but I just want to, to say a few words more. In 2016, Glenn Merkett will be 80 years old. He hasn't stopped designing, he hasn't stopped teaching or talking about his work, and here he is at Shoalhaven. Or thinking and learning about our connection to the land. It's a lifelong preoccupation. And it behoves, I think, all of us to think about this connection, this connection to the land. And also to be reminded, as Glenn Merkett was, by the philosopher and poet Henry David Thoreau, who said, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. As an architect, Glenn Merkett might also reflect on the power and force of finding higher things in the natural and also in the material world. Higher, feel, higher feelings in the buildings and spaces that we experience and that for those who are lucky enough to produce. For an architect like Mies van der Rohe, he's famously quoted as saying, God is in the details. Merkut might have a different saying to describe his own personal poetry, that God is actually in the section. Thank you very much. We'll now go for a question answer session. We may take around three questions. Thank you for the wonderful All presentation. Right. Yeah, um, as you have mentioned that uh, Glen Market has developed uh, the uh, architectural language for vernacular architecture in Australia. And uh, this is really very sophisticated sustainable strategies uh, in terms of detail, ventilation, or spatial quality, um, but uh, where the development is very substantial, especially I would like to mention about uh, the developments in Sydney. I was privileged to work in Sydney for two years with Crawford Architects, mm -hmm. and what I have seen um, there, the development, the resi especially res residential development rate is very high. Correct. And uh, do you think the young architects or uh, the recent architects, they have adopted the language of Glen Market or not? Uh, it's a very good question. And Thank it, you, it, it's, uh, it, it's quite um, a difficult thing to talk about because in some respects, Glen Merkett doesn't practice in the city. Uh, most of architects practice in the city and their daily work is designing high-density residential apartments in the city. Uh, but I think in many respects, uh, Merkert understands his position uh, as a poet might or a commentator might. He doesn't necessarily um, uh, uh, think that everyone should design like him. Uh, because he knows that there is a huge part of, the pro of everyone's professional life which doesn't necessarily have these extraordinary sites or these extraordinary clients who are willing to live in a, in a sense simply. Uh, so many Australian architects um, understand and appreciate his ideals. To actually bring them back into the city is challenging, but I think 
if one takes on Merkut's ideas ethically, then one should try wherever possible to actually follow some of those ideas. Uh, you know, the, the idea of doing a linear house is not necessarily possible on every urban site in Sydney. Believe me. <laughs> it's, uh, so uh, there's great tension, I think, amongst a lot of younger architects about the validity of the Merkit position. Uh, uh, and so I, I think that's actually healthy for architecture culture to actually have people that don't necessarily say, look, he's a god, um, but there are other ways of thinking about it. But at the same time, I'd argue that in terms of his understanding of the landscape and his commitment, uh, that commitment is so heroic that you actually have to admire it. He's also made, I think one, one could say, um, a very selfish commitment to practising on his own. So he's deliberately not expanding the office to get too many big jobs. If you want to get a house built by Glenn Merkitt, you have to go onto a waiting list. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, almost in an eremitic or a hermit-like existence, he's prepared to give you the artwork and you have to be patient and wait. Um, and in some respects, that's an argument for slowing things down, slowing architecture down. Yeah, but a good question. There's a lot of architects in Melbourne who don't have that same uh, landscape setting of Sydney, saying, "We can't be Glen Merkitt. We've got, we've got, we've got other ideas." Um, at the same time, there's an enormously uh, uh, engrudging respect for the man and his work. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming here today. Thank you, sure. Professor Good, for giving us a wonderful lecture. Thank you.